We are back with another episode of Locked In with Ian Bick. On today's episode, I interview Jumpsuit Pablo, who spent a decade in a South Carolina state prison after getting caught for armed robberies. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And thank you guys for tuning in to Locked In with Ian Bick. Jumpsuit Pablo, man. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Thank I remember you, you were like one of the first creators I hit up when I was starting this podcast back in like January. And um, you were on probation at the time. And now right. you didn't even realize you got off probation. Yeah, I've been off, been off for about half a year and didn't even know it. But it's great to finally have you on the show. I remember first stumbling across you doing prison skits. Like the very first video I saw of you on TikTok was like it had like over a million views of you in an orange jumpsuit running around doing something funny. Yeah. Now I have to ask, is Jumpsuit Pablo your real name? Or what is your real name? Yes, first name Jumpsuit, last name Pablo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, man. Uh real name's Paul. Um just chose Pablo as a pseudonym for when I was locked up and kinda on Facebook and stuff while I was in prison on a contraband phone. You don't want to use your real name. They'll find you pretty easy. So uh I just went with Pablo and I was in a jumpsuit. So there you have jumpsuit Pablo. Honestly, that's a better name on an ID than McLovin. I mean, everyone calls me <laughs> yeah. McLovin, so but the yeah, jumpsuit yeah. Pablo one's great. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's get into it. Let's start at the beginning. Where are you from? How did you grow up? What's your family like? Well, I'm from uh, right by Greenville, South Carolina. It's pretty well known, but a little small town called Greer. Um, growing up, my dad, he was a preacher, so we were kind of just the preacher's family. You know, just Southern Baptist classic preacher's family, um, pretty sheltered, pretty kept away from any type of trouble, you know? So um, I guess just once I got to that age where you can kind of do what you want to do, uh, the other side of it just was just too fun, you know? And I kind of got into the partying and all that stuff. So that's where it started. <laughs> Did you have siblings or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, I got three sisters. They're all older than me. I'm the only boy, um, yeah. But they're all law followers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did you grow up um, lower class, middle class, upper class? What would you describe like your family? I guess middle for the South, <laughs> for like the small town South, maybe middle class, you know, something like that. So what do you think like started you kind of breaking away from like your family roots and getting involved with like hanging around people maybe you shouldn't have been around? and following down a different path and what's way different than what your parents raised you to become. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, growing up like that, you kind of got to fit the image of the preacher's family when you're a kid. And just once I got to the age where, you know, I'm in high school, I can party, I can go to parties, things like that. I mean, it's just fun, just the whole social thing. Cause we didn't really get to be around people when I was a kid. I couldn't have people over, couldn't go to people's house, you know. So it was just real strict. So, I mean, when I started like partying and going out, hanging around a bunch of people, that was fun. Started smoking weed, you know, drinking the classic uh, stuff. That was one thing. I guess that was the first step. But I'm, I mean, it, it started going bad when I started listening to Waka Flocka and Gucci Mane. That's what I, <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I heard that. Somebody played that and I heard it. And I was like, man, what is this? It just like turned me up. What was it about that music? I don't know. It just, just, I just heard it. It just made me want to turn up for no reason. And I was like, man, I want to, I want to kick doors too. I want to put goons on your mama too. And so. Do you think it was like similar to how kids feel like in this day and age with, cause this is, we're talking like 12, 15 years ago for you. Yeah. So do you think it's like similar to like kids playing like Grand Theft Auto and those violent games now? Is there truth behind that? And like they see those types of things or listen to that type of music? Well, I definitely don't want to say like, because I listen to rap music, that's why I did what I did and that's why I went to prison. You know, it's not, I mean, cause plenty of people listen to it and don't do it. I mean, that's me just being stupid and just easily influenced by stuff that, you know, I don't, I don't know. I just, uh, I just thought it was, cool and just thought it was fun a thrill it was also know. very different from where you came from i wonder if it was like a mixture of being raised in a strict family yeah i feel like it was music. like you know something along those lines just having a taste and it's just like you want more and more and more and just like how far can i go and just you just get carried away into something that you're really not 
you know, and that's kind of what it was. But I just went too far with it. Now in high school, you're partying, smoking weed. Are you doing any other types of drugs? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you might do a little acid, a e pill, a Xanax, something, you know, here and there. I mean, whatever. You're dabbling in everything. Yeah, I mean, just a little, you know, whatever's whatever's going around, whatever comes and your way. What year is this to put it into perspective? Um. Well, I mean, it was, I started smoking weed when I was like 16, which for a lot of people, that's pretty late, you know, from who I've talked to, but. Um, that's like what, early 2000s or, or? Yeah, like 2010, 2009, something like that. Okay. And how old are you now today? Right now I'm 30. I just turned 31. Oh, happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. All right. So you're smoking in high school, not really getting into too much crime. What's like the first crime you commit? Like when, when's like that turning Probably point? Probably shoplifting. I mean, just stealing, you know, what I feel like that's with? how everybody starts just grabbing a Snicker bar from the gas station. I know? remember I stole a pack of gum and a pack of water <laughs> balloons <laughs> yeah. when I was like a little water kid. Water balloons? Yeah. Because like my parents wouldn't get it for me and I just grabbed it oh, off the shelf. That. I got to have these water balloons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just snatched yeah. that shit up and I took it and it yeah. was like a high. I don't know. Like you said, every kid does it. Yeah. 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 But how does that propel like eventually you get caught up with armed robbery. So how do you go from a petty shoplifting crime to by the time you're 21, 22, you're going away for 10 years in prison? I feel like it was, it was, uh, you know, to be honest, I feel like it was this thing where, you know, I started, uh, it started with just getting drunk and maybe having some backyard bites, you know, we're in the South, you know, we're fighting in the backyard for fun our buddies and just like if you win like I don't know like you know the more fights you get in it just like it's like I liked that that rush you know and it I guess it kind of started with that and I was like man I want to see how bad I can really be you know not like looking back as an adult I'm like you wasn't shit but you know I guess it kind of started from there you know and I just kept taking it further now I'm like you know I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the truth is I don't, I hate when people ask me that because I just don't have a good answer. I don't have any answer that really excuses it or makes a lot of sense or just anything. I just think I was just lost and just fucking trying to find yourself. Just got carried away with some shit, just living some shit that I just shouldn't have even been doing. You now, know? now, is your dad like paying attention to what you're doing? Because he had clearly like a very strict control over the family. So is, is he watching how you're starting to kind of like diverge off that family life? No, because, um, well, when I was 14, my parents got divorced. So I'm not living with him anymore. Uh, so no, he's not really aware of it. I mean, my mom's not either. I mean, they don't know, you know, that's what you do in high school. You go to parties without your parents knowing. So, I mean, they don't yeah. really know. They know a little bit, but they don't know, like, all that's going on. Do you think the divorce was, like, a trigger for you? Oh, it probably gave me some freedom, you know, to kind of, like, going off on my own and stuff like that. Not as much discipline and strictness, you know. So, But I don't, you know, who knows how I would. Because that happened right when I'm kind of turning 14. So who knows once I became a teenager, whether they stay together or not, what I, you know, how much I would have rebelled and started doing on my own, no matter what. You know? Now your friends during this period of time, are they getting into trouble too? Are you hanging around like a bad crowd? I, I, was, I would say, yeah, but not, not as much as me. So you were the, the main, the I'm black just taking sheep. it too far. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm just taking it a little too far. I just got way too carried away. So yeah, they'll get in trouble, you know, but. I would just get in more, you know, I would always be the one who got in a little more trouble. So, so what happens the day of like these robberies, you commit a couple robberies, walk, walk us through what exactly happened, how it went down and, and how you get caught ultimately. Well, I think it was, um, I mean, it, it kind of starts with the fact that I had already been to prison when I was 19, I was on a youthful offender type of thing where it's your, you know, you're young under 20 first felony, some stuff they do in South Carolina. And I basically got like four months for an armed robbery. And I think I was like, I, I took like a Xanax for the first time or something. And, um, I had robbed like local people with who had drugs, you know, not the toughest guys, but just, you know, people are, are around my city. And for some reason, you know, once I took that Xanax, I just thought it was a good idea. Hey, let me just go rob a store until I rob a store with a gun. 
And about three months later, I got caught. You know, I don't know how. But I mean, I why did it take them three months? I don't know. Them? That's what I don't. Wow. I don't know. They just showed up one day. <laughs> while well, you I was were on charged the as a youthful offender. Well, they charged me, and they, like it was my first time, like in real trouble. You know, um, so yeah, they they gave me like a youthful offender thing, dropped it down to strong arm robbery, and I got like four months and some like it's you go to prison, but it's kind of like you're you know it's like a youth program type of thing, like boot camp type of thing in prison. So, but it wasn't enough. To deter to you. To do anything to me. Yeah. It, it wasn't enough to like snap me out of it. What did your parents or what it specifically, what did your dad say to you when you got caught that first time? Well, we weren't really talking. We, we, we just didn't talk. You know what I mean? We didn't. He just wasn't like, you know, you say he's a, you know, he's a preacher and stuff like that, but that doesn't always mean like they're the best person, you know? So just things were never that great. So once that happened, a divorce happened and now I'm old enough to kind of like have a little bit of free will, just chose not to talk to him. And I mean, you hear cases all the time about how that the parent is like a, a role model in in the community, in society. And then like at home, like their home life is just so much different. They're yeah. not that same person. So it must have been hard on you in, in that sense, too. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was just real like superficial, I would say, like because it's a preacher family. So you got to like play that role yeah. when you're around other people. And that's kind of part of the reason why we weren't allowed to have people over. I wasn't too much allowed to go to other people's houses, maybe one friend. You know, but um, which just kind of, you know, you know, that's that's the reason. Yeah, I guess. Now, how does a teenager get a gun to even commit this robbery? Like, where do you get that from? Because when I grew up, there was no like I couldn't I didn't have easy access to like grab a gun if I wanted to. Well, it's the South. It's, I, mean, I, think, I guess a lot more people got. I don't know. Everybody's got a gun down there. It's somebody's dad or something, you know, but some I don't, I don't know. I was riding around with some girl who was like I was like. I think I just turned uh, 18 the first time I did that, first time I got my hands on a gun. And she was probably like 20, 21. And uh, I don't know. I was just like, I want to go to Rob's store. And she's like, well, I got a gun at home. So we went to her house and we got the gun and I went and did it. Did you ever think like you could do the robbery without a gun? Or was it just because of like music or whatever that you knew that robbery equated to gun and gun equated to robbery? I mean, I don't know. In my mind, I didn't want, I wanted to do it with a gun. You know, like, and I don't know, maybe some music, but just at that point, I'd already just like got caught up in, in, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Do, Again, do you, it's just. So, do just you think the different. robbery was more about the money or more about just like being a part of the life and living like this, you know, like th this crime life, I guess you could call it. I think it, it was maybe 49, 51, 49% about the money and 51% about just like after the fact, like, yeah, I did that. Yeah. You know. That rush, like yeah. that feel, that yeah. adrenaline. Yeah. So you get caught with this, do they give you probation, jail? What do you what do you get as a as a uh, Well, you know, they gave me the four months and then I was on a youthful offender parole, which was lasting for a year or two, I don't know. Um so eleven months into that parole, once I come home, um I just start violent. I started selling weed very small time, nothing like, like pounds or anything, but like just small time selling weed. Um, started doing the robberies, like not on stores. I was like, I'll never rob another store again. That was so stupid. You know, I'll never do that again. And I started, I was just robbing like drug dealers and stuff around there for like two ounces and st just small stuff. And um, just kind of living like that. And uh, I think I got pulled over one day, caught with some weed. And it was clear that I, it was like to sell and not to use. So uh, all that got back to my PO and um, I don't know, it didn't violate me, but basically like I was on house arrest. I had to go to these classes. I had to do all this stuff that I was just hard headed. I was like 20, 20, you know, 20 or something like that. And just wasn't going to do. I just, I don't know, you know, just young being stupid. I was just like, fuck that. I'm not, I'm not going to classes. I'm not. Yeah. What about, do you graduate high school? Uh, I got, no, I got it. I got expelled in. You got expelled in man. my second senior year. So college was off the table. No high school. Yeah, I mean, I got my GED. And what's like your mindset at this time? Like, you got a couple chances before you end up with the big sentence. Yeah. Well, definitely not appreciative of that of a chance that I got, and um, just like fuck that. Just like you know, don't not even thinking about a future or what am I gonna do with my life. Just like. I don't know what I thought. If I thought I was just going to maybe hit like some million dollar lick and just live, 
like that, you know, I don't know what I just what I wasn't thinking anything. Now, did you have a plan of like getting out of the life? No, nope. it was just going day by <laughs> just, day. Yeah. yeah, just just that dumb, that stupid. Just so what happens at the second robbery that ultimately ends so up. So I'm fucking basically. Long story short, I'm fucking up on my parole, you know, and so it's kind of to a point where like I'm not showing up to my shit, you know, my my dates, my report dates. So I'm just I, I know that I'm fucked, and um, at this point I can't stay at my home, you know, my mom where I live because she's like. I mean, she's on, you know, she's going to like tell my officer what, you know, because she wants me to get right and do right, you know, so she's not like enabling any of my bullshit, you know, so I can't stay there. Um, Don't have a job. Don't, you know, I'm just living literally robbery, robbery, because once I got house arrest, it killed all my like clientele for any type of little weed I was selling. So like I have nothing. So I'm just like robbing people. And then I robbed everybody to where nobody will even meet me anymore because they already know it's a small town. Everybody knows. So I'm like, fuck. So I'm like running out of my last bit of money. I know I'm on the run, basically on the run from parole. So I'm like, I'm at some party with this guy who I always did the robberies with. And um, it's like 2 a.m. or something. And it's time to leave. And I'm basically out of money. I don't even have money to buy a hotel for that night. So I'm like, shit, let's go to a gas station because I don't care. I just don't give a fuck, you know? And so I'm like, let's just go to a gas station. So, yeah, we leave and we go to a gas station. Well, we're going to a gas station that I had in mind. And on the way there, we pass one that looks very empty. And I'm like, hey, this looks, hey, pull over here r- right quick while we're at it. And I go in there and rob it. What do you do? Like, what's the scenario like? Well, I told him to, you know, ride down the road a little bit from the gas station. So he's not like there, you know, his car. I'm like, pull down here. There's like an abandoned house, like, you know, five driveways down from this um, gas station. He pulls in there. I'm like, count to 100 and then pull up the road and I'll just hop in. I'll be running down the road and hop in the car. I'm going to do it that quick. So that's what he does. I get out and I go in the thing and I'm just like, uh, my whole thing was like, and I don't have a mask or anything, you know, I just, my whole thing was like, I'm, I don't know what type of little secret buttons and, and, little things, booby traps they got back there. So my thinking was like, I'm gonna tell them to ring me up a carton of cigarettes because I might as well get that too, you know? And instead of a pack, I might as well get a carton, right? If I'm gonna do that. So I'm like, give me a carton. How much is a carton of cigarettes? And they're like, ring it up. And they'll be like, "Mm -hmm, 50, whatever. You know, I'm like, okay. And they'll be like, can I see some ID? I'm like, yeah. And at that point I just pull out the gun. Um, Cause 'cause now I know that you've rung me up you're able to open the register. I didn't want to hear any shit like, oh, I can't open the register unless a purchase is being made. You know, that was my thinking. So Are I'm you like, scared at all? No. Uh-huh. No. So he, he he opens the register. What happens next? Uh, oh, well, I just pull the gun out and I'm like, give me all the money. <laughs> and he just hands it over? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, they start like, this. Per- the first person started kind of like, they like went to reach for it thinking I was just instinctually just like I'm handing them my, my ID. You know, so they stop for a second, just look, and then they kind of like started like breathing, you know, pretty panicky. And so, but I didn't want to like do anything. You know, I wouldn't, I don't know if I was prepared to like do anything if like shit went wrong or nobody like did what I told them to do. But they don't know but, that. But they don't know that. And, yeah. and they, and they did. So they did that. And then while they were like getting the money, I'm just kind of talking like, uh, you know, I'm just here to get the money. I'm not here to do anything crazy i'm just gonna you know and i'm gonna go so don't you know no 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 and uh i think they later told the detective like i was the most polite person who like who could have been doing that in the that most moment. polite robber yeah <laughs> what a nickname. and um and then like this truck this old like beat up rusty truck pulls up and you know the gas station's got like their whole wall is like glass see through so it's like you can clearly see me in there and this truck pulls up right in front of us like right in line with us and i'm like looking i'm just like fuck and i'm like try to hurry up because if this man comes in here you know i don't know like what is going to happen or what this will turn into so they kind of like hurry up but luckily he was just he never even looked up he was like scratching off a lotto ticket or something in his truck so they gave me the money and i took that and i took the carton of cigarettes because i might as well (laughs) and i uh, went out i didn't want to run because this guy so i walked out and i kind of cut around the building and once i cut around the building out of sight I just took off running and uh, it was literally like right on time with like him pulling up and I hopped in out of sight of cameras and uh, 
you weren't worried about cameras inside the store. Like you just, you're on probation, you're, you're wanted or anything and you, you didn't care. So did you go into that store knowing like you would probably eventually get caught? Like, was that made up in your mind? I don't, I don't, I just don't think I even thought about it, cared what happened. You know what I mean? Just, just. How much money do you get from this robbery? <laughs> like the 300 bucks, 200 so bucks. So looking on this now, was the 300 bucks in a carton of cigarettes worth 10 years in prison? Absolutely not. That's wild. <laughs> Absolutely not. That is so wild. Like in the yeah. moment, but at that time frame. But at that time, I'm like, I can get a hotel and I can get some pizza and some beer. <laughs> you were fighting to live another day. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That's I mean, crazy. I just, I don't know what I, th I thought. Somebody would probably just kill me. You know, somebody I robbed would probably just fucking kill me, and I didn't give a fuck. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't think about, like, at that time, I know I certainly didn't at that age ever think about, like, the consequences of actions. It was always, I mean, let me yeah. get through today. Yeah. So how do you eventually get caught? How long passes from that robbery? Well, you know, I go down to the next store and rob that one. The one I was originally on the way to, I'll tell you, we, we were going to this store that was about 30 minutes away, and on the way there, we see one. And it's actually the same brand of gas station, so it's like, that owner really hates me now. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, so we did that one and then we continued on to the one I originally had in mind. I robbed that one too the same way, but the person was a little sassy this time. They like, we're like talking shit, but they still did it, but they were just like <laughs> shitting on me the whole time. And you got the same amount of money? Just, I mean, about, yeah, just about. And then what happens after that? You leave that one? Uh, get dropped off at a motel, paid for a night at the motel with my girl, me and my girl. And um, go to sleep. And then what, the cops kick down your door? Well, the next day, uh, well, at this point, I'm like, I got to go. I got to get out of the city. Does I'm she gonna... know that you robbed? Yeah, she's in the car. She's in, in the, the back car. Seat. Okay. She didn't know I was going to, but yeah, she didn't know I was going to do that. But So your plan is to get out of the city and, and just leave? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. That's why I was like, it's no just plan. so stupid. Yeah, yeah, like you, like you think I'm gonna like hit you with some logic. <laughs> There's none. No, it's in interesting there, to hear. You know? But um, yeah. So I'm like, I'm gonna get out of the city and just, I'm just gonna like find a fucking plug and just like go clandestine in there. And I'm either gonna not make it, and then it's like, fuck it, I'm gonna worry about it, or I'm gonna make it and I'll like live the next like i don't know you know i thought you could just probably live forever off of some big lick so i guess know. the second option didn't work out too well no you know i know never made it out of the city um oh you so, didn't even make it out of the city oh no so <laughs> so i was at the hotel and i was like I got, i'm going on the run i need some going on the run supplies so i went and got like a pack of hanes shirts and like some toothpaste and like i think i got a box of bullets from some ammo shop in front of walmart and then I got like a case of beer and a $5 Little Caesars pizza. And I'm like, all right, I got my buddy to pick me up. At, um, and my girl's at the hotel. So um, so we're on our way back. I got my pizza. I got my beer. I got my bullets. I got my hygiene products. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go. <laughs> got my traveling suitcase. I'm ready. You know, this is going to be great. I'm going to make it. And so we're on the way back to the hotel. We're probably about five minutes from the from the hotel. And I get this call from my girl. And she's like, She's like, baby, don't come back here. Don't come back here. They're out here. They're everywhere. And I'm like, my heart sinks. And I'm, but, but at the same time, I'm on parole, you know? So I'm like, well, they're here because I did, you know, I violated parole. They don't know what I've done, you know? So I'm like, and, and at the same time, it's not like the, it's not like you fucking, uh, five-star hotel. I mean, they could be looking for anybody. I mean, this is a shit motel. Everyone here is probably wanted by the police. So they may not even be there for me. That's what I'm hoping. You know, you're going to hold on to that. So I'm like, she's like, I'm like, she's like, yeah, they're all like out here with guns and vests. They're like looking all over, like they're looking at room numbers. And I'm like, well, they're probably not even there for me. And then like, she's like, oh, they're coming. She's like, I got to go. They're coming to the room right now. They're coming to the room. I'm like, yeah. And she's like, yeah. And like, hangs up. So I'm like, fuck. And we drive by the motel. Like 10 seconds later, I'm like, don't turn in. And I look, there's fucking cars impalas crown vicks all in the parking lot why do you even go back i didn't go back well you drove like you drove by well i drove by it's yeah. on the highway okay. i mean it just you pass it by yeah. i mean i was almost there when she called me okay so we got to pass it anyways you know so i mean we just i just look and i'm like fuck um and so now it's i'm, I'm trying to find a place to go i don't know where to go so we're just kind of riding around trying to figure out what's going on so i get a call from her 
you know, while we're trying to find a place. And she's like, yeah, they're here with your parole officer. They know about this. They know about that. Did they arrest her at that time or no? No, but you know, they're like, she's like 18. So they're putting pressure on her. Like you're fucked forever. If you don't Did she, does she try fold? to like set him up, get, convince him to come back here and shit like, like that. some dog, the bounty hunter. Yeah. Type so shit. like, she's <laughs> scared to death, you know, but even though she's been, didn't, you know, she didn't have anything to do with it. But, um, <laughs> so I'm like, uh, yeah, I find that out. I'm like, fuck. But the people driving me don't even know what I've done. They think they're looking for me because parole and they don't realize what I did like the previous night. So, um, I'm like, man, take me to the guy. We can just call him Al, but take me to the guy's house who I did this robbery with. And I do all the robberies with, and he was in on it. He knew about it. He got a cut of the money. He was the driver. You know, I'm like, take me to his house. So it's about 30 minutes to his house. And we start heading there and I'm calling him and I'm like, um, Hey man, like he won't answer. I'm like, fuck. So I'm calling him. I'm like, man, you got to let me come lay low at your house. Like, man, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, no, no, you can't right now. I'm like, man, come on, dude. It, I'm fucked right now. You got to let me come. He's like, very hesitantly and reluctantly. He's like, all right, man, come on, come on. I'm like, okay. So we're on the way there. Um, get pulled over. My guy pulls over. The cops come. They like check the ID of the guy driving who looks just like me at this time. He has long hair like me. He's skinny with tattoos like me. And they check and they're like, mm, it looks like I hear them muttering to each other. They're like, eh, it looks just like him, but that's not his name. And they like give him his idea. And he's like, sorry about that. This car matches the description of someone carrying an armed robbery suspect. And he's like, oh, damn, that's crazy. And he's like, have a nice day. So we leave. And yeah, you're we, just we, in the back seat. I'm in the back seat. We well, keep driving. Why didn't they and, check your ID? I don't know. They just checked his. And so, I mean, there was another person in the back seat too. You know, okay. I mean, there was a car full of people. So it just didn't fit the description they I, figured out. I guess out. they yeah. just, I don't know. I guess they just slipped. And so like the guy turns around, he's like, can you believe there's somebody riding around in the same car as us who just robbed the fucking store last so night? I'm like, yeah, that's know. crazy. Huh? He still doesn't know. No, that he doesn't know. Oh, I'm just wow. like, man, that's, that's wild. <laughs> Small world. And I'm like, fuck, they know. That's when I really knew like they know about that too. So we're on the way to the guy's house like 10 minutes from getting there and we get pulled over again and um but this time it's like way more serious like everyone's like <laughs> got their police cruiser doors open with guns pointed and they're like on the megaphone like everyone down on your belly on the ground you know and they how got, long ago was this like after you got pulled over the first time probably like 20 minutes so they probably realized that they fucked up and then well i'll tell you um you know that that's what you figure but um so they get me Long story short, I'm like, they get me, everybody else goes. They don't got anything to do with it. My girl goes, she ain't got nothing to do with it. It's just me. So they get me there. And it's not until six months into jail when you get your like motion of discovery and stuff. You're just in the all county your, jail. All, yeah, yeah, you get your like, basically how everything unfolded, all the paperwork. And I realized uh, the guy, my driver had told on me. He told? Um, they went to his house first. And basically the context was they didn't know he was involved in any way but they saw his truck come at this four-way stop, which is right by the gas station. So they barely caught him and his tag. And they were like, man, as soon as this guy ran off that direction, this truck came that direction. So they went to his house with the intent of like, hey, did you see this guy get into a car? They had no leads. I guess like my face wasn't very visible and stuff like that. So uh, they're like, did you see this guy go into a house or a car? What was the description of this car? You know, that's what they were going to ask. And so they get to his door and they start like, but, you know, they knock and they're basically just like, hey, we're, you, you know, we, you know, we're here because you were around this location at this time last night. And he just folds. I mean, he's like, OK, but I didn't know. I didn't know he was going to do that. His name's Paul. You know, um, I just dropped him off at this motel and this motel room number, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's how they knew and came to my motel. And so I call him and, I'm, and that's why he didn't want me to come to his house. Okay. You see? And so um, he finally is like, OK, come on. And then it says later that right after that call, he had called them. Oh, and, and then said he's on he's okay. on the way to my house. And what car you're driving, all that. Yeah, that's crazy, so man. That's how they got me. But wow. now he, uh, and so about three years into my prison sentence, I called home, and somebody was like, "Man, did you hear about Al?" I'm like, "Well, no, what?" And he's like, "He's dead." He died. How did he, he die? He got in a car wreck, oh, a drunk shit. driving accident or something. He was drunk. I guess. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy how life works out, like karma, life, everything like that. Yeah. Because he was equally involved with the... He was. You know, and, and, and you know, other people are, they kind of say like, well, he kind of, he really like in the end did you a favor because who knows what 
you would have done, you might have died or you might have did something so much worse that you got more time. And that's true. You know, and ultimately it was it, it, it's good that that happened when it did before it went further. But at the same time, uh, yeah, I mean, he was just as much. I mean, he did everything. He, every robbery I did, he was there. Yeah. You know. So uh, you're arrested, brought to county. Do you get a plea deal? Do you go to trial? What's that? What's well, they the legal looked at process? It, I mean, of course, they looked at it like, okay, we already like cut you a break on your first robbery of a store. Now you got two more 30 minutes apart. No deal, no break. It's like, well, no, they're like, we'll give you 10 years. And, and South Carolina has a mandatory minimum of 10 years for an armed robbery. And so um, it was 10. Like, they never budged. You know, I sat in the county for like a year and a half, two years. Just waiting. Yeah, and they're like, you can get 10 or you can like <laughs> go to trial and probably get 30. So eventually I was like, okay, I'll take the 10. Do you have a public defender or a paid lawyer? A public defender. Are you talking to your family too while you're sitting in the county jail? Yeah, my mom, you know. Not she, your dad at all at this point? No. What about your sisters? A little bit. Maybe one of them. What are they the saying The one I'm just you? more close. What are, like, the conversations like? Oh, my mom's like, I don't know. I mean, what do you say? <laughs> you know, I mean, she's just like, she knew that I was, like I said, you know, she I was already not doing what I was supposed to do, so it wasn't like some big you know, reveal that I'm out here doing bullshit, but it was just like, uh, you know, I don't know. Just, are you reflecting at that point in time? Like on, are you regretting or are you still in like that same, like, you know, young troubled, you know, gang banger type mindset? Well, I mean, at the, before, you know, at the time in the County, I'm still kind of thinking, uh, this won't happen to me. I won't get 10 years, you know, it wasn't They're saying real, that, right? but that's mm -hmm. not what it's going to turn out to be. There's no way that I could get 10 years in prison. But I did. And it, it, when you're sentenced to that 10 years, is that when it hits you? Like, what's the feeling like of being in front of a judge and, and he says to you, you know, you spend the next decade in a state prison? What goes through someone's head in that moment? Well, um, I guess, uh, you know, I went so long not wanting to accept the plea deal. Um, it got to a point where, and I just kept thinking, nah, at the last minute, they're going to like drop it to something. They'll drop it to something. There's no way. Just kind of in denial about it. And I think at the very end, they were like, okay, you can take 10 or we're going to fucking trial. And I'm in the county long enough to know, like, that's not what you want to do. You know? So, um, I'm like, okay, I'll take the 10. But literally like the day I told my public defender, I'd take the 10. She said, it's like one day expired their final plea. And she said the bet, and so she emails the prosecutor, and they're like, "Best we'll give you now is open plea ten to thirty, so I could receive anywhere from ten to thirty years." And usually, if you have an open plea, you're going to get somewhere in the middle of that. So I was, you know, so it was likely I was going to get about twenty. So that it took me two years just to come to grips with, like, okay, I guess I'm doing ten, and now it's like I might get twenty, might get thirty. Yeah, I mean, like the average person goes in at like zero to X amount. They don't yeah. go in at where well, you're starting at 10. So that's got to be scary. Yeah, I was like, if I get a day over 10, I'm just going to drop dead. Well, there's no <laughs> fucking way. But they gave you the this long to just be okay with it. But, you know, I went in there. And so that's even worse. You know, it's not like I'm going in there like, you know, man, they're going to give me like, what's it like to hear 10? It's like at this point, I'm begging for 10. I'm hoping I get 10, which is just. That what fucked yeah, in terrible. itself. Like that's just. Do you so... speak at your sentencing? Like, are you remorseful? Are you saying like I fucked up? I need another chance? Or, um, well, you know, I had a very nice judge, um, and uh, my family came on my behalf. You know, my mom, my sister was were there. My grandparents were there. You know, my mom spoke, and uh, she tried. You know, but and, and you know, honestly, the judge. She was crying. She had to get a tissue and stuff. The and judge was crying. Yeah, she was crying. And she was like, you know, I honestly think I would rather give you some type of like rehab, like in house, like eighteen month rehab or something like that. But my hands are tied because they, we have this mandatory minimum of uh, ten years. You know, she's like, there's literally nothing I can do, but I will give you time served for all the days you've done in jail, and that's about, like the best I can do. And I'll give you ten. I'm not going to go over day over ten. So I, like, you know, any other judge might have given me thrown the book at you. Yeah. yeah. Did your dad show up at sentencing? No. How did that affect you mentally? It didn't because I didn't fuck with him. You were done with him by that point. I hadn't fucked with him for a long time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I wonder what the judge is thinking too. She probably sees like this young kid, like it's kind of a broken family at this point in time. 
Yeah, I mean, my mom stands up and says, like, such good stuff. You know, she's like, he's never been violent, like, with his family. He's not like that, you know, and he's just, um, you know, she doesn't, you know, she's just, she's, she's going to talk about her son like any mother's going to talk about her son. Or, like, the Pretty victims much. show up at sentencing to speak to? I don't, I don't think any victims spoke. No. Yeah. Spoke. Just like the people that were actually like robbed and under that pressure and like staring down the gun. I don't think anybody showed up. Yeah. Now you, after you get sentenced, they move you to your home prison. What prison is that? And what well, is you it? Go to, you go to Kirkland uh, where they evaluate you for about 30 days. And they figure out based on your sentence, if you've been locked up before, what happened when you were locked up before? I mean, did you <laughs> stab people or did you just like never break a rule or are you in a gang? Are you gang affiliated? Are you, you know, lock, you know, do you need mental health uh, medication do you need like any type they take all that into consideration and, and determine like what prison yard within that state you should be at so did I you was, oh, go on i mean i was there for about 30 40 days before they decided where i should go did you feel like the county prepared you for what was to come yeah yeah definitely um you know it got me used to it because i never you know like like i said i'd done four months i've been to prison um but that wasn't shit, you know. So, um, yeah, two years in the county it definitely like got me, you know, just in the mind frame of being incarcerated. But it was still pretty different from jail to prison, you know. Yeah. Now, the, when you finally land at your home prison, what is it, and what type of security prison is it? Well, it's funny because the first prison they sent me to was a level one, which is minimum security. There's no gate or you know, no no. You got lucky or anything, yeah, and um had a lot of privileges and stuff and but you know usually they send people there when they got like a year or six months something like that left and um and i still had like at this point seven eight years left <laughs> so uh it, it was kind of fucked up like not seeing a fence and just i could look across the street and there was a car dealership so I you're like just, this is sweet <laughs> yeah it, yeah i was just like god i just want to walk off here so bad but you know did they realize they made a mistake and they kicked you up or no um you know I'm, I'm i'm only like 23 at this point and i hadn't like honestly i hadn't fully like it's not like you know i've I'm a changed man, you know, and I've seen the full error of my ways and I've fully matured from the mind state that I was in, you know, at this point. So, I mean, I'm still, like, I was getting into fights. I'm like, I'm starting this decade in prison. I mean, I got a fight. I'm fighting people. When at issues. a low security prison, you're causing this kind of trouble. Well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not like causing trouble. I mean, I wasn't the only one. I mean, people fight, you yeah. know, obviously not as much or like as wild as uh you know other other security prisons but i mean people still fight um they're less likely to and just people are in the mind state of going home most people are there. But you so are. they're not looking mm -hmm. for that but i'm just starting and i'm young and i'm like i can't not you know like you got to do that you know what i mean you're you know trying to is. survive like you're yeah, trying to figure like it out like i can't come in here and like not fight when like an issue happens like i'm gonna have a hell of a seven eight years ahead of me now you know, are if I don't. people giving you a hard time because like you're a young white kid like did you have tattoos like do you look the way you look now when you first started in well, i mean i definitely got more tattoos but i was still like pretty much all that and, and that. so you kind of like you knew what time it was going in like what you had to do essentially well i mean i know like a young white guy is not gonna receive like the the entry level amount of respect is like you know a black guy or just anybody else other than just your regular white guy who isn't like just bald with <laughs> head tats and you know. Like, so yeah, what's whatever. like your first move as a young white kid in prison to like ass assert that authority? Like you're not someone to be fucked with or messed around with. Well, I mean, I just, you know, I learned enough to know that, you don't. Know, I'm not going to like go trying to like act like I'm going to come in here and like shove my weight around and stuff and like me do anything to cause any fights. But, People definitely like try to play you like a bitch or just like, you know, when you just mind in your own, I mean, you don't look for trouble, but trouble will come your way. And so when it came my way, I would fight and, you know, wouldn't like win <laughs> a lot of times. I mean, sometimes <laughs> but I you got to just get, try get fuck up. But I mean, you know, in prison, it you know, whether you win or lose, it doesn't really matter Did, um, as long as you fight. Guys you know? try to try you at all or anything like yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the first, uh, the first, oh, well, the first one, um, I got this job in the kitchen and I was like the dishwasher. It guy. always starts with the kitchen job. Yeah. I, I was the dishwasher guy and it was like, 
I just washed all the dishes and it's time for me to like in five minutes, my shift is leaving and the next shift is coming in. And so this next shift, like biscuit maker guy, who's like a blood or something, he comes in and he's like, and he immediately starts putting these dirty biscuit batter filled pots in this sink that I just finished like clearing out. And I'm about to leave in like three minutes. I'm not going to do it. So, you know, he, he notices that I'm not coming over there to do it. So he goes, Mosey's over there and starts like doing it. He like doing it real aggressive. Like he's mad that he has to do it. And he starts like mumbling, kind of mumbling to himself, but you know, loud enough purposely to where I can hear them. Puss it, bitch it. Just all this shit talking about me and like every, it's clear, like everyone else can hear. There's everyone's there. We all know he's talking about me. So I can't just like stand there and not do shit. So I walk over there and I'm like, Hey man, are you talking about me? And he turns around like mad that I even came and said that, like the audacity. So he's like, yeah, I'm talking about you. And I'm like, oh, well, what are you, you know, you trying to get with me after, um, after your job or something? And he's like, he's like, yeah. And he thought about it. He's like, matter of fact, we can do it right after the, uh, the little bell goes off, you know, like, fuck that. You can, we can come to go to the bathroom and be ward. We'll meet there. And I'm like, okay. You know, so, um, that happens and we go back there and we go in the bathroom and I'm like, I go in there first and I'm kind of like just ready. And he comes in there and uh, we square up and I go to swing and he just boom, hit me so fast and hard. Like I just saw like green and he just beat the fuck out of me for about a good 20, 25 seconds, beat the shit out of me all over the bathroom. I'm like slipping and sliding. You know, the bathroom's always wet. I'm like slipping in the mop buckets and shit, just getting the shit beat out of me. And uh, then he just stops and walks out and I got up and walked out. And, uh, and you, I'm sure you gained respect for that. Well, yeah. I mean, for that and for the fact that like so many, especially on a minimum security, so many people will go tell right away. And I didn't, you uh, know, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to, what's the point of like getting my ass wood if I just like ruin all that fucking respect. by. You know, what's so. interesting about it is that we we were the same exact age when we went to prison. Yeah. We're both white. We're at low security prisons and people don't think that this type of shit happens in lows. And even though mine was federal, yours was state, but it does happen. And yeah. we both handled our situations like very differently. Like I'm, I'm not a fighter. I'm not a confrontational type person. Like, that shit happened to me and like we both handled it in very different ways. So it's interesting that you like knew at that point in time, like you had to swing and you showed up. I'm sure the guy was surprised that you showed up too. Yeah. You know, and I mean, it's like, you know, it, it was just a different thing. Like I just kind of learned, um, it's kind of like different. Like in high school, it's like, if you get beat, if you fight and then you get beat up, like you're just clowned and like, you're like, they like, you know, you're, you're not living that down for weeks, but if you just fight, you know, you'll still get respect just for doing that. It's just when you don't fight. Like, I mean, they're, they're, people who want to, like, push people around are going to look at it like, well, there's too many people who aren't going to at least make me whoop their ass. And I'll just rather do that than, than rather deal with somebody who's not going to make me do that, yeah. you know, instead of, like, do this. So, I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I just, I just didn't want to live like that. I mean... It sucked already, you know, that I was going to be in there. I just didn't want to live like that. You know, I didn't have any, I, I mean, I didn't have any other way. Like, I didn't have any money. I didn't know how to hustle. I didn't know anything like that. I wasn't from the streets to where I just come in there and I already know how to, like, make something out of nothing. I'm a preacher's kid who just started doing dumb shit. So, like, I'm in there. Like, I got to at least fight or stand there and get hit. Now, did you stay at a low security prison or did they bump you up? No, I was there about seven months. Oh, that uh, didn't last long? I got long. in probably about five fights. Okay. You know, I'm um, in like, I think the last fight I got caught. So they just sent me to immediately to a level two um, medium security. But it was like one that they called like a baby three. Because it's like there's some medium securities that aren't that bad. And then there's some that are like, they're so bad that they're damn near like a three, which is the worst and as what, far as violence. What so. type of people are at this facility? Well, see, so you get a mix at that point because, you know, level three is more for like life sentences and, and, and things close to that, 40 years, 30 years. But you get a lot of people who have that kind of time or have life sentences even, but they're able to maybe not get in trouble for a certain amount of time and they're able to get on medium security. So you'll have a mix of people who have maybe five years, 10 years, 20 years or life sentence. You kind of just get a big mix of people and um, got like, <laughs> yeah, I mean. What are the, like the gangs and the politics like? Are, are, does anyone come up to you as like this new white kid on the block and asking you about anything? 
Yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, I was in a gang. I, I joined a gang in prison. What kind of gang did you join? Oh, uh, it was G's. G's. Yeah, and, G's. And is it just like all white guys? How's it? No, no. It's uh, I mean, you just had, you had. Uh, you don't really have any white. You know, like you see in like other prisons, there'll be like the white people, black people, Hispanic people. It's not motivated it's nothing, by race. No, there's no race based gangs in there. You know, I mean, I guess like the you got Bloods, Crips, and, and GD. That's it, Pyru. You know, but Bloods, Crips, and GD, and uh, you know, Crips might have a few white boys. If you see a white Crip, he's probably and he's accepted, then he's probably crazy. You know, and fucking wild. Um, there's a lot more white G's you know than did any other type of white gang member um because you know they're allowed they're kind of like the only gang that white boys can really join and so when you know if there's you know there's white guys who who will do what they gotta do and there's some that can fucking fuck some people up so uh, they definitely get recruited if they're not already in it before they come to prison and um i mean i would fight and i didn't lose every fight you know uh i mean i won enough but I certainly got beat, like, probably 50-50. What's it like to be a member of a gang in prison? Like, what's, like, an everyday life? What What are some of the things you're you're forced to do or have to take part in? I mean, it helps you. I mean, it's helpful in the ways of, um, you know, you, you got people there who, I mean, I guess it just depends on the, the, the group of guys that you're around who are also affiliated. You could be around a, a bad group or a good group who, like, really does the right thing with what you're supposed to do, like, looks out for each other like food or like teaches you things or like you're new I'm gonna like teach you you know I'm just or just tries to like mentor you there could be a guy who's been in there 15 years and it's like why do you want to get mentored by an inmate okay but he might have been in there so long that he's I mean he's got more time to serve but he's made his changes and he's matured and he's looked back on his mistakes and he's able to give some advice he's just not out of prison yet for what he did decades ago and so you know they're supposed to just help people you know, like me, who hadn't hadn't gotten through my fucking head yet. So it like gave you, like, some stability yeah. in prison. Yeah, so, I mean, there's good things that can come out of it. And then, of course, you know, you're going to be obligated to, to participate in things that might not have shit to do with you, but now it does because you're involved in this gang. You might have to participate in violations, a box where, you know, it's you and two other members surrounding one guy who's in violation, and you got to, like, beat him, and, but he'll fight back you know, for however many seconds and um, you got to do that. Or you might be the guy who fucked up and you might be getting beat by three other guys for however long. Or, I mean, it might, you know, you're expected and obligated to represent this gang that you're a part of. So, you know, you might have an issue. You might be the only one in there, you know, and then there's these other gangs and they might want to exploit you because you're the only one there and you got to take that, <laughs> take that fucking beating, you know, instead of just like laying down because you're representing you know, so there'll be no shame if you get the shit beat out of you. Cause what can you do? He's just one man. But if you just sit there and like puss it out and basically let yourself get extorted and all that shit, like, well, then you're not representing well. So, I mean, just little obligations like that. Or if, if a big riot pops off, you know, between gangs, I mean, you're going to have to participate. So as like a member of a prison gang, what's considered like a violation? What are the no's? That can be a couple of things. Uh, like stealing, like, like stealing sneakily. You know, they're kind of more like, if you're going to take something, you got to go take it, like, straight up. Or, but some places they might, it just depends on where you're at and what the environment is and what the politics are there. Some people might be like, no taking, no stealing, like, no taking either, you know. Um, not paying your debts to people, gang members or, not, you know, non-gang members, you know. Um, not paying your debts. Maybe if you drink wine and you, like, can't handle it and you're causing problems and you're acting, you know, ways that you wouldn't act if you weren't drunk. And so now you're like disrespecting people and just doing too much and you're, you're causing problems. And so now you're causing problems for everybody because we're supposed to be, you know, we're going to have to be there for you, but you've brought everybody into some shit just because you want to be drunk and be dumb. So, you know, they'll get you for that. Just if you, you know, just little violations like that. What are like some bad situations you've been in because you were like a member Um, I mean, like, real bad. I mean, I remember at one point, uh, there was a lot of beef going on with these Crips. These, like, rolling 60s Crips and the Gs. But it wasn't, I, I mean, it wasn't anything that I was starting or even had any parts with. I didn't even, wasn't even in it. It was really just, like, two or three guys all together, collectively, from both gangs. And because these main guys weren't getting along, everybody was involved in, like, it seemed like every other day or every two days, 
we would be in such a tense situation where everybody had to be out there on the rock, on the common area, strapped up with the knife while these guys like hashed it out in a room or something and decided basically if we were about to like pop off or not, you know? And so you're just sitting there like sick feeling in your stomach because you don't know what the fuck's about to happen. And then at the same time that they're, they, if it would have, they probably would have fucking fucked us up because they had some, they just, I mean, they just happened to have some fucking. Are you in like constant fear? Animals on their fucking side at that time. Are you in like constant fear, like walking around? Like, do you always have to have like a knife on you? Like, how does it work? No, well, I thought so at first, but I mean, after so many years, I mean, I, you, you learn how to move. And uh, I mean, it, it kind of gets to a point too where, um, I mean, you'll have people from different gangs might be more close with each other than people of their own gang because people kind of get to where they deal with the person and not the gang. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, you might just be a real person, a real ass, like real solid, respectable person who's just very good and fair and, and, and just right in the way that they deal and treat people no matter who they are. And so, you know, you know, it can be like that. So it's not just like I'm always tense because there's other gang members around. And I got to where I like learned how to socialize and just deal with people. And I was pretty well liked because, you know, I wasn't going around trying to start anything. I never wanted to go around starting anything. Unlike before prison where I would go out and try to rob people and shit. Now it's like, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. Cause you, you're going to get, <laughs> somebody's going to, you're not the toughest thing in there. You know, every, somebody will always do something to you. Yeah. You know, so I mean, it hum basically it humbled me, and it humbles everybody. And um, when you're around a bunch of guys who will do shit like that, everybody kind of just you don't try to be tough with each other. You're glad when there's no issues. You're you're happy for peace. So if there's no reason to have an issue, everyone's glad for it, and people can get along. So a lot of days you're not walking around in fear and shit. If there's like a troublemaker who's about to start some shit, people might get more mad at that just that one guy. We might discipline that if he's in our game, we might discipline him ourselves just for like, you're about to fuck up the whole piece. You're about to fuck up the whole atmosphere in here because you're out here doing some dumb shit. So, is there like paperwork checking at all? Like in the federal system, do you guys like someone new is on the yard or they're saying, hey, we need to see your paperwork, make sure you're good? Um, you know, I've heard of like prisons where they do that to anybody, no matter who you are when they enter. I, I that doesn't really happen unless you are joining a gang or in a gang. So, there's like an introductory period or something like that. Yeah, um, I mean, if you're gonna join, you gotta like show your motion of discovery and stuff, and just show that you didn't write any statements or snitch or anything like that. Um, if you're already in there, it may not happen unless like something comes up, some allegations or some rumors or something like that, and it's like, well, we're gonna have to check. All right, so something I'm very curious about, like your story, because um, you're very vocal about it on like social media, is cell phones in state prison yeah. how do they come in like how common are they what are the prices what's like the breakdown oh man um they're i mean they're very common you know there's probably like 10 to 15 in every cell block um at, you know the, the prices it's changed it changed over the years because it just progressively got harder and harder to get them in when i first got there you get a cell phone a brand new cell phone with a charger for like 300 to 500 dollars that's it yeah and wow. then just over the years i started going to a thousand and then two thousand by the time i left you were able to sell a cell phone for anywhere from five grand to 6500 yeah when i was in prison they were like three grand at the low when yeah. they're at the camp they're a lot cheaper but it's all about supply and demand yeah, right because you know what it's just over time like ways and methods get fucked up or get known about by the staff and one big thing that changed it in 2018 there was this big riot and made the news and I think it was supposed to, I think they said it was the deadliest riot in the US in the past 25 years. It happened at Lee County in South Carolina and I think like seven inmates died. They were saying like bodies were stacked on top of each other. It was a big riot. So many people got killed and like the, it changed everything. They changed the color of the jumpsuits from tan to bright orange so they could see people at night. A lot of changes got made and one of those was um, in addition to the fences, they put up these hundred foot tall, I think, nets. So something nobody could, cause they were just throwing it over the fence, you know? So something nobody could throw over this net. I mean, it's huge. So guys put their money together, started buying drones and just getting the drones they to fly. They got drones yeah. bringing in phones. Yeah. yeah. So they're just putting their money together, sending it to someone out there, getting them to buy a drone. And you know, drones like they'll like fuck up and fall and like the staff gets them. So they know about them, you know, they're well aware of it. But 
yeah, started bringing in that shit with a drone, just flying over the net. So, but it was harder and more expensive. So that drove the price up. It, it it's let, it's not as successful as often as before. So yeah, it's a lot harder and it just kept driving the price up. So. What kind of phones are there? Like I know iPhones were very hard to come by because yeah. of the chargers. Yeah. So. I didn't see, I, did, I saw like one iPhone and that was like literally my last six months. My roommate got an iPhone. Um, but not even like the good, like the fucking dollar store. How, how do you charge a phone in prison? You just plug it in the outlet. So it's regular chargers. Like in the feds, we had to like customize it, put it in the lights, do all that type yeah, of stuff. I mean, you can like on lockup, they might do that. But no, we got outlets because, um, I mean, you, like you can, you can buy lamps, TVs, hot water pots and stuff on the canteen. So they keep, there's an outlet, a working outlet or two in every cell. So, um. We would just get the charger sent in with it. Where are guys like hiding their phone? Like if you guys are in a cell, how does that work? Well, you know, different yard. It's different for different yards. Cause some yards have the environment where they know guys got phones, you know, and some yards are very like adamant about going around almost daily or every other day. And they are on it like a bloodhound to get these phones. And then other yards, they know these guys got them, but it, it might be a more violent environment. And they kind of just like look at it like, Hey, we're not going to pressure. We're not going to put too much pressure on finding these phones until people start showing up with holes in them. Do you know why like, we keep that down? And so that will like cause people to be like, hold on, hold on, let's not take it there, man. We don't need it. Everybody's going to get fucked up. Everybody's going to lose their phone. Now everybody's got to pay five grand again. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that kind of that uh, check and balance. Do you think guys are snitching on other people um, about the phone so they can then sell another phone? Uh, may, maybe, I don't know if so much to sell another phone, but you know, it might be guys who are just like wanting to get guys out of there. Maybe they owe them money. Maybe they're, maybe they were the kind of, they had the most influence. Um, and they were running shit until some guy got there. Maybe the past three months he's been running it and they, and they just, and they can't like, they can't outdo that guy, but they want him out of there so they can, you know, so they might like, that's an opportunity. It's like a know. revolving door. Yeah. So, yeah. What so happens, they might do something like that. What happens when you get caught with the phone in prison? Well, in our prison, I mean, if you get caught with a phone, I think most places you have to get caught maybe two times in a six month period or maybe on your third ever phone charge. You, if you get caught with a phone, a charger, anything that obviously is from a cell phone that shows that you had a cell phone, um, three charges altogether or two within a six month period, you'll do 30 days in solitary. But other than that, Nothing. They'll take the phone. You might lose your, can't get canteen for 30 days. Can't use the phone, like the real phone for 30 days. Shit like that. Now, does having cell phones in prison, like change the currency on the compound? Like I hear now, like in comments and stuff, people are like, oh, they're not trading ramen noodles or mackerels anymore. Now they're using like cash app to send each other money. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a little trading going on, but yeah, cash app. It used to be PayPal, but yeah, cash app is the main thing now. Um, yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think guys just, I think, you know, they try to spin it like guys are put, use, you know, they'll, they'll, the staff will get on like news or something like that and just be like, guys are using cell phones to put hits out on officers. <laughs> like, is that true? Like, not, are I mean, I think it happened once, but not really. Guys are getting on, guys are getting on there to get on Facebook and to like get on date naps and FaceTime chicks and like get them to like try to show them something and just talk to chicks and, 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 get on Facebook and I mean, just browse social media like all, everybody else. You know, I they feel just like wanna... it's more in the movies about like having a contraband phone in prison and they're like trying to set up. I mean, it happens, yeah. but setting up I mean, more crime. Well, you know, and they definitely use it. I mean, they definitely use it to, to set up more contraband getting yeah, brought but that's, in. That's but, different than yeah, the crime I mean, But yeah, it's not, they're not like putting hits. That's like going to bring some fucking heat. You know, and these guys are already worried about like, like it's got to be some shit we're gonna fuck up like bring all this heat on the dorm to like stab this guy up real bad and send him out of here like he had to fucking devastatingly cross some line you think we're gonna fucking put a hit out <laughs> on a fucking officer it fucks up everyone's like, hustle that would just like kill the yard you now know? you brought up dating apps in prison what's like how does that work like if you're in prison and you're on a dating app are girl do girls they know that they, you're in prison they love it they love it why do they love it what's the logic and how does this go down these well, i think it's just it attracts a certain type but I mean, there's just girls who love it. I mean, there's girls who will fucking laugh at it and think it's ridiculous. And then there's girls who like love it. So what do you set your location as? Like in prison, what do you do? Well, you know, I didn't get on a date nap. I'd just be on Facebook and just get, I mean, girls just come in your DM. 
I remember I, I was on Snapchat in prison. And I would get like girls like sending their shirtless photos. Yeah. Like there was like that 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 rush that they had doing yeah. that and stuff. Yeah, they love it. They they think it's so cool and they want to know like how you got a phone. They want to know like how people are what's it like in going there? live from prison. Going live. I'm I on see TikTok that all the time. and I see. See, people. I was scared to show my face, but um. Yeah, I mean, once like you know, cause yeah, I mean, once a girl like gets in your DMs, like I like you know everything. So. Yeah, I, we used plenty of fish a lot too. Yeah, that was like the big thing. Yeah. I don't think anyone uses it like now in the uh, street. People started but... getting on like Hinge and uh, <laughs> uh, what was that other one? Um, I don't know Hinge. And stuff. So guys would match with someone and then set and up a phone put a call. Picture themselves in prison, like flexing, and like shit. a video date or something. They I mean, it's have? a it's an amazing. I mean, I mean, you got to think it's. I mean. Chicks are gonna reach out and have some questions. I mean, it's a it gets a conversation so started. Like the end of like pen palling is so like no one's pen palling anymore People with the right of prisoner. You don't write letters now. It's Facetime a no, prisoner. We're Facetime. There could be some big money in that. Like if some if the prison, I know prisons Listen. are starting to implement like iPads and stuff. Yeah, they um well they brought in some tablets, but you can't get on the internet or anything. You know they got games, movies, TV shows. You could rent a movie from the tablet. Yeah. What kind of movies? Can Whatever they got on there. Um. They try to keep it pretty up to date. Not you're not gonna have the newest, yeah. but uh, they try to keep it pretty up to date. They got little games, you know, little like Candy Crush and just you know your little mom games and stuff. But you can do like inmate messaging, yeah, um, like message credits, you know, to where you can message people like twenty five cents a message and shit like that. So That's awesome. You can do video calls on it. So they're, you know they're hoping by that they can kind of eliminate the need for cell phones. Like people won't want to get them in that bag because we're giving you a tablet. Now, how much time do you actually serve on the 10 years? Is it the full 10 years? Oh, or? about nine years. So they didn't give so you my much last, good time? Huh? There's, no, there's not much good time or parole or no, anything? No, because, well, they'll give you good time if you have a nonviolent charge and you're doing 60, no, 70% of your time for a nonviolent, and then you can earn up to like 90 if you like mess up. But if you have a violent charge like me, you don't get any good time. So, I mean, that really is, there's no reason not to go in there and fuck, you know, drink, get there cell was no phones, incentive. do whatever the fuck you want to do. Because yeah. I mean, I, you can't. There's no good time. I'm not losing anything. So, what year do you get out, and how old are you? I got out. Um, I got out on New Year's De uh, Eve of 2021. So basically, January 1st of 2022. So a year and a half ago. Yeah. Great day to get out. <laughs> Start the new year yeah, on a new yeah. route. Yeah. What so. was life like for you getting out after all this time or some like hard adjustments? Well, you know, I feel like it definitely wasn't as hard as it would have been if I hadn't had a cell phone for like the last like five years, because, you know, the, just the world changed a lot, you know, from the time when I, when I got locked up, like, man, the mean, like me, you didn't even have memes, you know, on the internet, like memes didn't even exist. And then you get out and it's like, you know, just think of all the changes socially that have happened to the country and just the world, just in that course from 2012, to 2022 you know so much. so if i wouldn't have had a cell phone and i'm on social media to know all that like it probably would have been a, a bit more of a shock just in that sense but yeah, I'm you pretty had like much 10 iphone generations come out in those right. times so i mean i was pretty up to date on that stuff but i mean it was just wild just i don't know i, mean, I made a you know a video about this I, I was saying like you know i immediately went to the grocery store like my parents took me to the grocery store to get my groceries and like i just felt like i didn't belong there yet felt like i was at a part of a prison i wasn't supposed to be in like i snuck into the back of the commissary <laughs> you know what i mean like you just feel like you're not there you know you, it's I just surreal it's, yeah yeah I'm, i remember they like took me to a restaurant to eat and like just the waitress coming up and politely like asking would i like a refill can i get you anything and she's so like bubbly and it just fucked me up because you used to people like you know, you're trying to sneak and get an extra cup of milk at breakfast. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and now that you're like asking me, is there anything else I can do for you? It was just crazy. It's you a know? new level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how was your relationship with your parents at that point? Are you starting to rebuild it? Uh, well, yeah, I, I had been talking with my mom probably the last year before I came home and uh, she was nervous. I could tell she was nervous. Like, is he going to come home and be the same or worse? Has he really learned anything? You know, but, um, from the first day and then just more so every day since she's really been proud, you know, of just the changes I've made. I've just matured. I, I mean, I grew up, you know, I'm 30, 31, you know, and I definitely <laughs> learned, like, I feel like at one, in one way, like when you're going from 20 to 30, you're, you got to learn lessons, like just to, from growing up and becoming a man. And then it's like, you're learning those lessons in prison. So like just both of those just kind of, it just really turned my, 
it puts a lot of pressure around. on someone to grow up that's for sure yeah that type of environment for that time yeah and i i mean i i mean i come out and like man i cringe like when i look back on that shit like from just how i was before but i, I just cringe yeah even just talking about it here i'm just like i don't fucking know like, dude for like for so long i was cringe about talking about it. i didn't want to talk about yeah. it i didn't want to talk about it but just, it's very yeah. it, it helps to talk about like it. you want to say like oh well i had to because of this or you know i had no choice or like you know this and that and it's like did you have inclinations to get back into crime when you got out or was that just done no i i didn't i didn't want to do any, anything that would get me back in prison and I had and really you know, yeah <laughs> I didn't want to do shit what was it like to like be intimate with someone after 10 years like what's that feeling like how how does it go well it took me a while you know I mean um you know I got a girlfriend now but at first I knew I didn't want to come out and like really get like jump into something like that you know because I was too worried like am I even going to be able to like socialize normally i mean you're around a whole different world and a whole different crowd and whole different cast well, of you're characters around just by men too in, yeah, it, yeah in, in in prison and just like just the things you'll even talk about you know once you get out there are just so different i'm like i i wanted to even see like am i gonna be able to even get right you know at first and it and it wasn't that easy you know just walking through the mall or walking through a grocery store all these people around you walking behind you walking close talking loud you know it, it just was all you know it was it was an adjustment, you know, and I wasn't, I needed to get myself together before I even think about, I'm going to pursue a relationship with somebody. You needed some alone time. Yeah. I mean, that's real for a lot of people, even yeah. that haven't gone to prison, you have to fix you and focus yeah. on you before you could even be comfortable right. having that with someone. And I was pretty open about that with my girlfriend now, you know, and I mean, she understood and she was patient and, um, and we kept hanging out and took it at our own pace and, um, got to where we're at now, which is great, you know? So now I am ready for that. It's been good. You yeah. Know? Do you think that time was helpful just to like have your space and, and yeah. figure shit out? To yeah. Cause I needed to get myself together. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I needed to like get the foundation of even being back in the world before I like, let me try to have a good, healthy relationship on top of that. You know, when you hadn't had any type of shit in 10 years yeah you know it's uh, I'm just, yeah. what kind of work did you get into? Was it hard to find a job? What was life like in that sense? Um, I never got a job. I <laughs> you never worked a job. Uh, wow. I got I got on TikTok the first month I got out. Somebody they encouraged me on Facebook. Yeah. So why did you get on TikTok? Well, I used to make memes in prison because I'd be bored, and I started making memes, and I would go viral just making memes. They would start going viral on Facebook, and I caught like a taste of like social media fame. Yeah, kind like of, well, yeah. yeah, that and just like I think something's funny. I create it. Everyone else thinks it's funny, and it feels good. You know, it was a rush. So. I just kind of got got into that. And so when I got out, everybody had already been kind of like keeping up with my shit because I would post on Facebook all the time. And so, um, but the cell phones are so cheap, I couldn't even like download TikTok, like bigger apps, yeah. more than one social media at a time. So I just stayed on Facebook. So I got out and I made like a little video or something, posted it on Facebook and they were like, you need to get on TikTok. I said, all right, I'll try it. And like the second week I got out, I got on TikTok and within a week I had hit a million views. Wow. On it. And it just took off from there. I got like 100,000 followers in that month. And you're making money right off the bat on doing that? Yeah, because as soon as I hit 10K, they they monetize me. And so I'm just making money. I'll go live and get like donations. And, and that uh, was enough to live off of at the time. Yeah, because I mean, I live in the South. I mean, my total bills for a month are like $1,000. So yeah, that's like, crazy. I don't live like... <laughs> yeah. That's not like out here. Yeah. You can't live for 1000 bucks. Right. So I mean, I wasn't like ba just banking, you know, off social media when I first got out. But I mean, it was... It was enough. Did you see like a direction at that point? Like, hey, I want to make like social media Absolutely. the rest of my life? Because I knew I was going to do something um, before I got out because I started recording videos of myself in prison and the stuff, just in pre preparation, yeah. you know, to, to use because I knew it would be good stuff. But I can't risk showing this right now because it's too, I'll, I'll go to solitary and you know, I'll get fucked up. So, um, you know, I came home and I started doing like funny things, like little short things not related to prison. But then I would also tell I used to get on Facebook and write short stories about true things in prison. But instead of being like, this is how, this is how many people I beat up or this is how, you know, tough I am. You know, I just started talking about funny things because, you know, prison is a crazy place with crazy people. And you see a lot of crazy in a funny way, like <laughs> shit. There's so many characters. And I feel like you never hear about that. And, and I feel like people are tired of hearing about how everybody's. You know, the, I was the biggest killer on the yard all the goddamn time, you know. But that's something that's interesting about, like, prison content creation because 
it's such an open market that any yeah. there's not like there's room for everyone right. in it like that because you're always going to have a different perspective right. and like you said people are moving away from like the stabbing and the yeah. violent prison shit they want like different person it's more about so personality much, like, there's there's so much else to bring that's just as interesting yeah but, like your you know, experience is way be... different than mine and we do yeah. different things and I, I like you've definitely evolved as a creator too because now you're kind of finding your niche and what exactly you're yeah. doing like you have that great Murdoff, uh yeah. content and stuff so that's awesome what yeah. would you say is like the message of your platform um like what do you hope if if someone's man, watching it what do you want them to take away from it besides the entertainment and the comedy part definitely um that it, I mean, it's never too late or you've never like fallen too much to start like turning it around or pursuing your dream even more than that, you know? Cause when I got out, I'm like, internet creation is for like young people. Not that I'm old, but just like, I mean, you know, I feel that way when I see like younger creators and um, you know, I'm, I'm just starting, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't do this, you know, but you can and, and that's what I wanted to do and it's not too late. And I've been, I've made the dumbest choices and been through the most bullshit that I got myself into, but I'm still, I was able to come out and, and just get blessed. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just putting the work in and pursuing this dream. So it's never too late. You know, you've never been, you never fucked up too bad to where you can't chase your dream. And then also um, just turn, I mean, I love to just think, that I've turned a negative into a positive. You know, I'm not trying to like glorify anything or what I've been through, but that's kind of why I started doing the comedy, you know, just like, how can I take something bad and turn it into something that can be enjoyed, you know, in a, in a better way or just in a harmless way, you know, just turn it into something good. Cause I mean, it happened. I can't change that it happened and that I had to go through that, but I'm just trying to turn it into something good. Yeah, I admire that shit. Cause it's like comeback stories are awesome. And like yeah. anyone that could take a negative and turn it into a positive, yeah. And, it, and it's going to inspire people, not even just people that have been to prison. That, that's why there, right. uh, there's more people that haven't been to prison that watch our content yeah. than people that have actually gone to prison. Right. Now, if you could s say, like, we took me out of the picture right now and you could sit across from your 21, 22-year-old self, what do, you, what do you tell that person? You know, um, it's hard to say because a lot of times I wonder it sucks that you know, I fucked up and was just that stupid. And so I feel like I'd want to tell him how stupid he is, you know, and just like, bro, like <laughs> get, prepare for a future. And Because if I started now and I'm succeeding, you could have started back then and you probably would have found just as much success. But then at, at the same time, I wonder if I would have learned the same thing because I was so hard headed and it took me so much to wake me up. I wonder if I would have been the same person or, or come to the same realizations and learn the same lessons that I have now, if I hadn't have gone through that, you know, so it's kind of, it's kind of hard to say, you know, cause you want to say like, don't do that, but maybe it was for the best, but I don't know. I guess I like to think that I, if I mean, you don't do it, you at least give it another five years and you'll probably learn this shit a better, a, a, a easier way. Does like the past haunt you, like your past decisions, prison? Yeah. And I mean, I guess I would also say, um, get, get real. <laughs> You're not Waka Flocka. Um, bro, like go go work on some stand up, you know. Like that's that's who I really am. You Isn't know, he I like in jail now too? Waka Flocka. No, he's huh. like turning. No, that's the crazy thing because like I, I want to like kick doors because I'm listening to Waka going hard, I'm and then I, and then like three Waka. years into prison, like, like I watch like TMZ and they're like Waka's turned his life around. He's doing great. And he doesn't rob anymore, and he's living his best life. I'm like, well, great. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Jumpsuit. Thanks for coming out today, yeah, man. man. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, we appreciate you and we wish you the best, man. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me.